processing plants to those who stock the grocery shelves, these now essential workers are faced with the choice of working and risking being exposed or staying at home but without income. People in the United States, right here in our community, are literally going hungry. Food banks have tripled and quadrupled their distribution of food, and people are lining up in some places for blocks in order to get food. As bank accounts hit zero, millions are faced with the prospect of losing their homes, of becoming homeless. While we have now surpassed the number of 105,000 deaths in this country, in the last few weeks, states, including Florida, have begun to say that we need to open up. But even as we open up, our state is registering between 300 to over 1,000 new cases daily. The infection rate is not decreasing and the death toll is mounting. And harking back to the pandemic of 1918, there are warnings that we may be setting ourselves up to see thousands more infected and dying. This is the time of COVID-19. But I'd like for us to consider a question. Is the problem the virus? Or is it something about the priorities of the society that we live in? I might get in trouble for saying this. Some of you may not agree with where I'm going. But we live in a society built on a capitalist economic system. Many in Latin America and even in the well-known thinker Noam Chomsky would describe this system today as savage capitalism. What is the main interest of capitalism? Harking back to the Brazilian doctor's analysis of the medical model, it's all about money, right? The central driving force of capitalism by definition is not people, but profits. And what is going on right now for us as a nation as we witness the push and pull to opening up versus keeping each other safe is a questioning of our very foundations, of what is important, of who we are at the core. Are we the village that it takes to raise a child, a village whose commitment is to each other, or are we all about the game, damn what else may come? I would wager, at least in this crowd, even if you don't agree with all of my analysis, that we are village people, right? We are a people who in our deepest hearts of hearts, in the core of who we are and what we stand for, we are for each other. And that is what we desire and dream for our nation and for our world. A society in which there are not people working full time, but unable to afford rent or food a society in which it is no longer the case that overwhelmingly black men and women are killed by white police officers or by self-proclaimed citizen vigilantes, at times in broad daylight, without any concern about video, video cameras recording the ghastly scene. Modern lynching it is, really. We dream of a society where people are not forced to choose between healthcare and bankruptcy, a society where everyone of whatever gender, race, ethnicity, or creed are valued for who they are and the gifts they bring equally. A society, a world in which wealth and resources are distributed in such a way that everyone benefits. And I'm not talking about taking from the rich to give to the poor, but rather a society built in such a way that there are not rich and poor, not a 1% and the rest of us, but where everyone has a reasonable share of the pie. A world where we are moving away from an environmental holocaust, where the news is not telling us of burning rainforests and of leaking petroleum pipelines and of suffocating smog. A world in which our food is fresh and healthy and not poisoned with pesticides and other toxins, where the soil is nurtured and made rich not raped and then put on life support with layers of fertilizers that become runoff. I'm sure each of us could add other details to this dream. But perhaps, perhaps we feel impotent. It's a wonderful dream, 
but we feel that it is not possible. But I disagree. No system lasts forever. No empire is everlasting. The feudal system had its time. Despite England and a few other places, kings and queens had their time. Economies built on the backs of slaves had their time, even though we still live with remnants of that time in our world yet today. And as several writers I have read recently suggest, actually capitalism is one of the more fragile systems and its day too will come. One example of the new being possible. I had the privilege to be part of a solidarity mission to Venezuela this past January. Not interested to argue the pros or cons of Venezuela and its government. Although I do oppose my country, the United States, using its economic and military power to try to determine how other countries live and are governed. But that's a story for another day. But Venezuela, as probably all of us know, is along with Iran, Cuba, and other places, a country subject to a crippling U.S. embargo. What I learned in Venezuela was that virtually all imports and exports are being barred. Food, petroleum products, parts for machines, seeds, fertilizers, and other items used in agriculture, none of these things were getting into the country. And even now during the pandemic, the import, the import of medicines to Venezuela is prohibited. We visited farms where tractors and combines were sitting idle for lack of parts or fuel. Everyone we met admitted that the embargo is devastating and that the country is in crisis. But one thing we observed and learned in contrast to what the news media and our government tell us here in the US was that people are not going hungry and people are not rising up against their government but are rather defending it. And the crisis has created the opportunity to think differently, to think creatively, and to build something new. In several parts of the country, we visited huge agricultural collectives involving hundreds, in one case, several thousand families and thousands of acres of small farms. The farmers in these collectives, unable to access the traditional seeds, fertilizers, and pesticides from Monsanto and the other ag giants, we're learning and putting into practice organic ways of growing food. They had start out, started out with the intent of providing for their own families, but have now reached a point that they're providing food for surrounding communities and for urban populations. Rather than de depending on distribution systems, they're building direct connections between the collectives and local markets. People pay less for fresh, organically grown fruits and vegetables, and for meat, eggs, milk, and cheese. And without the intermediaries and the grocery chain profits, the farmers are actually receiving more for their produce. An organization known as Pueblo a Pueblo is building connections between farmer groups and specific urban communities, providing food to the communities and creating exchanges that enable people in the city to experience the farms and deepen their understanding of where their food comes from. And what was most amazing to me was the dream. The people we met with recognized that they were building a new kind of world, not dependent on the agricultural giants, not dependent on the global capitalist supply chain, not producing food layered with toxins. They are living into a national vision, one where everyone benefits in a healthy and sustainable way from the resources of the land. Sisters and brothers, recognizing and agonizing over the pain and losses that this time of COVID has brought us, I believe that it is also an opportunity to think in new ways and to consider how we may build the new. While the virus may be a threat and a source of crisis in itself, I believe that it is also uncovering or has uncovered the gaping fault structures and failures within the system that, it, at, that at this point has so shaped our lives. Post-COVID, we talk about a new normal. 
as a sign I saw read, dare we not return to normal because what was normal is actually the problem. We must return to better, left, less self-centered, forming greater solidarity and community, being more human. I challenge us, I challenge us seriously. What will we do with this time? What others, what organizations and movements will we put our time into in order to rethink, to imagine, to be a part of moving us toward that new world that we dream of? I close today with a poem by Rowan White, which is where the title of the sermon comes from. Today, I choose to plant seeds. An expression of faith and life for self is to sow seeds into dark soil, not knowing what awaits. Returning to the patience, reverence, grace, humility practiced by our ancestors, who knew how to feed the hungers of time that call down the rains with a simple song. It is those kinds of people whose memory courses through my veins like wild rivers, reminding me to wake up amidst the confusion, to do what must be done to feed the children, to tuck vibrant seeds into fertile soil and patiently tend the garden, back bent in service. To those whose faces look up at us from the well-worn path we walk, the garden that our ancestors left for us is beautiful. May we water it well with our tears and our laughter, our stories and our songs. Today, I choose to plant seeds of hope into the winds of an unknown future. May we grow from this tiny seed of remembrance, this intimate immensity, coming totally apart, emerging out of the hard shell of generations of protection and prayer, a seed coat tempered by love and loss, joy and pain, completely coming undone to reorient to this new form, new dawn, the time to be those ancestors our children are waiting for is upon us. What seeds are you sowing today?